We design and engineer in America and assemble more vehicles here than anyone else. It's why, at a moment's notice, we can take American ingenuity and our manufacturing capability and put it to work. Building respirators, ventilators, and face shields. Building what we've been building for over a century. An unbreakable connection between the Ford Motor Company and America. Thanks for joining us today for our session, Pivot, Ford's response to COVID-19. I'm Emily Sutherland and I'm part of our talent acquisition team. Like a lot of you, Ford employees left their workspaces in mid-March and many of us haven't been back since. We've learned a lot about working from home, being flexible and resilient these past seven months. At Ford, we have seven truths that guide how we live, act, and communicate. We put these on display every day, but perhaps never more than during this pandemic. The team you're about to meet has been an example of being curious, creating tomorrow, literally in some cases, and being built Ford tough this year. I'm proud to join them to tell the story of how Ford pivoted to respond to COVID-19. With that, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Rachel McCleary from Government Public Policy Communications, who's calling from Washington, D.C. Rachel? Thank you so much, Emily, and thank you to the Ford team for inviting me to be a part of today's presentation. It's great to see so many of you interested in Ford, and I'm really excited to share a part of our COVID response story with you today. Uh, so as you can see, um, I'm currently the Government and Public Policy Communications Manager at Ford. As Emily said, I work out of Ford's Washington office supporting that team. This is my first job in the private sector, but prior to that, I worked in uh, government relations on Capitol Hill, um, working with Senator Debbie Stabenow's office, Senator John Dingell, and I was also fortunate enough to be a political appointee in the Obama administration, um, working at Treasury in their Office of Tax and Economic Policy. Uh, I'm originally from Michigan, though I've been in D.C. for about 10 years, uh, but I am. My father works for Ford. He is going on his 29th year. so keeping it all in the family by working for Ford. So Ford has a rich history when it comes to stepping up in a crisis. I mean, it's really part of our identity and we hear Bill Ford say that a lot. And while the auto industry's role during World War II is relatively known, what many don't realize is that Ford specifically has helped in past health crises. In 1941, we worked with the Henry Ford Hospital to build affordable portable incubators to reduce infant deaths in rural areas. And in 1948, Ford thermal and design engineers actually built an iron lung for children who contracted polio when the nation was undergoing this massive epidemic. And fast forward to 2020, where we built up a variety of business and government partnerships to manufacture ventilators, face shields, face masks, respirators, and gowns. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about our ventilator story specifically. But before we get to that, um, we're going to play a video that really just recaps all these amazing efforts. Motor and Tesla are being given the go-ahead to make ventilators and other metal products fast. Here with an update is Ford executive himself, Bill Ford, on what his company is doing. Bill, are you guys going for it and taking the president's challenge? We are going like hell. There's a national emergency. We're responding to it. We are turning our amazing employees loose to solve these problems, and they're doing it. I'm so proud of them. Ford Motor Company has just announced it will produce ventilators to help overcome critical supply shortages to treat coronavirus patients. Some very good news there. Ford is also using its 3D printing factories to produce plastic face shields and respirator masks for healthcare workers. More good news. Well, I just want to confirm it is in our history, you know, that is chronicled in the arsenal of democracy about building a bomber every 63 minutes. We also actually built ventilators way back in history for premature babies and iron lungs when there was the polio epidemic. So mm. these are Ford folks at their best. You've heard the cries of healthcare workers, people on the front lines. What are you gonna do? This is a national emergency. You know, we need to get going. We haven't talked to anybody about any kind of reimbursement or anything like that. You know, this is a company, as you point out, we've been around 117 years. We've got great engineers and great manufacturing people and we're putting them to work. A shortage of ventilators and masks, protective wear for doctors remains, of course, a major concern for the healthcare workers on the front lines of this pandemic. President Trump is urging corporate America to step up. And this morning, the Ford Motor Company announced that they are heeding that call. They will manufacture masks and ventilators. The number one item that they asked for were masks. 
And there's a couple different versions. The one that's I think we're going to make the biggest impact on is a positive air pressure mask. We can produce hundreds of thousands of those pretty soon. We're actually starting to build those right now. So there will be no barrier to making these things get to where they're needed. At our best, uh, Ford just wants to make sure we do what we can to actually help. And so I've been overwhelmed by internal employees, UAW workers, supplier partners, other OEMs that have just reached out and said, how could we help? And uh, what we're trying to just do is marshal the, the strength and the best of of everyone to try to get more of the things that people need into their hands to help us fight the virus. This morning, Ford 3M, General Electric Healthcare are making tremendous numbers. They've already started respirators, ventilators, and face shields. It's uh, been really amazing to see these big, strong, powerful, and family-owned companies step up and make a lot of great product for what we're going through and what we will continue to be going through for a while. We are a family company, and we're also America's company. I mean, we make more vehicles here, we invest more in America, and we employ more hourly workers than any other car company. And we've always been America's company, and as a result, anytime the country needs us, we're there. So the idea that Ford would produce ventilators was actually already in motion before the president really publicly started calling on automakers to act. And as the government and public policy spokesperson, I was really engaged with how a lot of that came together behind the scenes. Um, it all started with this headline you see on the screen, a story that came out of Europe where the British government was asking manufacturers like Ford, Jaguar, and Honda to help make ventilators. And this, this story hit in Europe two days before we were prepared to announce a complete and total shutdown of our facilities in North America, something that the company hadn't done since World War II. So it was a massive deal. And in one of our crisis communications calls, you know, I, I raised this headline because I saw it and I thought, oh my gosh, this is something that we can do with the US government. This is a great idea. Um, I asked whether it was a possibility. I just tossed the question out to the group, whether we consider and I remember one colleague essentially saying, well, who's, who's going to build these? We're closing down all of our plants. And, you know, it was obviously a fair point. And it was just one of many logistical questions that would need to be solved in an extremely short period of time. We manufacture cars. We don't manufacture medical equipment. And while we had partnered with these amazing organizations in the past many, many years ago, we have never made ventilators. And we certainly never had to do it at a time where we had to completely rethink how we manufacture anything safely. So behind the scenes, our head of government relations, Mitch Bainwall, began sending this story to the White House directly saying, hey, have you guys seen this? Is this something that you think the U.S. might need? Because if anybody could help ramp up the production of medical devices in a short amount of time, it was the company that invented the assembly line. The same company that at height of production was rolling off one Model T off the line every 18 seconds. So we were ready to do it. We just had no idea how we were going to. And then soon after, our then CEO, Jim Hackett, was on the phone with Larry Kudlow, who is the National Economic Council Director in the White House, and said, look, we're, we're ready to go. Uh, and at this time, there was a really small group of us who knew that these conversations with the White House were even happening. Um, you know, the idea was that, look, we'll kind of figure it out on our end, see if this is possible, and then if we could do it, then we'll tell the world our great plans, and we're just going to have this, like, really long runway to tell the story the way we want it to. But as with many things in D.C., the news did not stay secret for long. Um, Larry Kudlow went on Fox News, and he mentioned that he'd been talking to a CEO from one Detroit automaker. In this case, it was GM. But of course, the media just jumped on that. And within 24 hours, news that the Detroit Three, Ford, GM, and Chrysler were in talks with the government to produce medical equipment was everywhere. And in 16 days, we went from exploring the possibility of production to announcing a partnership with GE Healthcare, another massive US-based company, to manufacture 50,000 ventilators. And I just want to take a moment to underscore how impactful that is for these two massive companies to come together and stay laser focused on one objective and to go from an idea on a storyboard 
to actual promises of ventilator numbers. I mean, it was incredible to move that quickly in such a short amount of time. But we did it. On August 28th, we shipped our 50,000th and final ventilator to the federal government. And what was really special about this ventilator for us, you know, is that it was scrappy. It was something that medical professionals and first responders could use anywhere. And this was happening in April, right? When we had no idea where or how or when people were going to get treated because hospitals were just completely overflowing. So, you know, much like our efforts um, to actually make ventilators, the product itself was also scrappy and durable and meant to be used in the worst possible scenarios for, for patients that need it most that otherwise might not have one. And so after we shipped our 50,000 ventilator, we moved into what we call Project Apollo Phase 2. And Project Apollo uh, is essentially the code name for our efforts generally, and it's meant to symbolize um, the astronauts in Apollo 11 who had to kind of pull out every type of scrap they could find on there um, when they were up in space to try to bring everybody back home safely. So Jim Hackett viewed that as a similar approach, that scrappiness that I've been talking about. So in, uh, in August and September, we started talking about what Project Apollo was going to do next. And, and we knew that the ventilator piece was essentially met. We hadn't heard that there was a need to, um, to produce anymore, so we were done. Then we looked internally and thought, okay, well, the pandemic's not going away anytime soon, and people are still in need. What do we do? So we made a commitment to produce 100 million medical-grade face masks for at-risk communities through 2021 all across the country. And as of today, we've produced 25 million, working with the Ford Fund, which is our philanthropic arm of the company, working with Ford Government Relations to get these masks out to those who need them. So collaboration, stepping up in a time of need, this is all part of our identity and it's continuing. Even though we're not making ventilators anymore, we're certainly still producing equipment and dedicating time and energy and efforts with our great UAW partners to make all of this equipment. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it around or turn it over to my colleague, Deborah, who's going to talk to you a little bit about the face shield component of what we were doing during this time. Hey, thanks, Rachel. So um, my name is Deborah Hotelling. I head up US regional communications. And what that means is all the local media work that's done, whether it's in Dallas or Miami or Boston or Sacramento, um, me, my team and I handle all of that on the ground work. And I'm based in Los Angeles. And I was, and Rachel was talking just a moment ago about these big actions that we uh, Ford engaged in in the early days of the pandemic. Um, but it also comes down to individuals and that individual pivoting. And I got a front row seat. Remember back to March? I mean, it was crazy. Rachel was just talking about it. We weren't sure what was going on. We didn't know how contagious it was. We just saw that there were these hot spots springing up everywhere. And we were hearing about um, hospitals and um, being overrun and all sorts of other things happening. And then at the end of March, I learned that Ford was going to be building face shields. My daughter, is an RN in an emergency room in Indianapolis, and it's her first year um, being an RN. And this is a text back and forth. Um, when we announced that we were gonna be building face shields, I pinged her and I'm like, hey, we're gonna be building face shields, you know, how important is that? And look at the dot, dot, dot at the bottom, because that's my daughter pausing, wondering how she's going to tell me that they're running out of PPE and her hospital is completely overrun with really, really sick people. And folks, um, that dot, dot, dot just hung there for a really, really, really long time. And as I was watching that and knowing what that meant, that's where I raised my hand. And even though I'm in Los Angeles and I'm a PR person, as Rachel's talked about, it had to be all hands on deck. So I raised my hand just to see whatever I could do. And this is what I learned. Um, so I was part, since I raised my hand, everybody was invited because we knew that it was gonna take all of us pivoting at the same time to make this work. So I got to be in some of these early, early meetings and it was 
logistics folks and our assembly plant people. It was designers and engineers and anybody, logistics, anybody who wanted to be part of this. And I, this is, my handwriting's awful, guys, sorry, but I thought that you might like to see some of my notes from this very, one of these very first meetings, because what it says is 100K face shields by next week, 1,000 tomorrow, five to six fold demand increase. And then in parentheses, I, I note 3 million still working out how. So what we were doing and what I was witnessing is all of us at Ford building the bridge while we were running across it. And there's always this sense, I think, when we get into corporate life that there's somebody, you know, high up at the top of the building who knows all the answers and you just have to find the person who has the answer and you figure it out. But when you get in these situations, you realize that there aren't answers, there are approaches, and there's passion and there's will. And so that is what I witnessed in this meeting that I was taking notes in, because this was a group of people and we were they were figuring it out together. We needed for the face shields, we needed um, elastic. And it turns out that most of the world's elastic is um, manufactured in Honduras, who had closed its borders. So there was no elastic. And so this was a group of people going, you know, I have a buddy who works for Hanes. Uh, they make they put elastic in socks. I'm going to give them a call and see what's going on. And then someone else would say, I know someone at Procter at P&G, and I think they make diapers. Maybe we could use those little diaper tabs and we could figure out how to do it there. And then someone else would go, oh, Nike. I have a buddy in Nike. They make shorts. It might work. So it really came down to that scrappiness of figuring out what we were going to do and trusting in the fact that even though we were gonna make 3 million, then we would figure it out on the fly. And then once we got out there, the world responded. So we made our announcement, right, Rachel, at the end of March about face shields and ventilators. And then people start hospitals, first responders, um, nursing homes, um, started calling us, calling forward because they knew that in the past we had always stepped up and they were hoping that we would do so again. And so um, Rachel and I, and through our media hotline and through the central line at world headquarters, we would get phone calls. And you can see some of these notes here saying, we're running out of PPE, uh, but if before you give it to us, make sure that you send some to New York City because we hear that they're in a terrible spot. Uh, we heard from nursing homes, we heard from the Navajo Nation and while we it, in coming days, we were able to figure out a way that we could work with entities to figure out where low supply levels were. In the very beginning, it was us at Ford reading the news, talking to people, figuring out where hospitals were, and then figuring out how to get them to a place. And in fact, in the early days, when we were first sending out some of those boxes, we knew the Detroit uh, first responders and hospitals needed it badly. And we couldn't even get a truck to go and pick them up and send them to the local hospitals because Ford employees would stop on their way home or on their way somewhere grocery shopping or doing something. And they would pick up those boxes and they would send, they would take them themselves to those locations because they knew that it had to be done. And it was our North Star, never a question of what we needed to do. And then as a result, we got them all out there and we figured it out. And it became this amazing rallying cry for us, our UAW workers, our executives, all of our experts. There was never a question of what we needed to do. And there's something really remarkable about working for a company where that North Star is so strong that you don't have to you know, ask somebody, do I, do I have permission to do this? We all had permission. And it was probably one of the most amazing moments in my career. Emily, I'm gonna toss it to you. Thanks um, for sharing that. It's so powerful and so amazing what we were able to do in such a short amount of time. Um, as Rachel and Deborah said, it was all hands on deck. And when we say all hands on deck, that includes our interns. Um, and so the, our internship this summer was certainly different. It was our first ever virtual internship. Um, and Taylor McCarthy is joining us, who is one of those interns. And Taylor's going to talk to us about his internship project, 
um, where he was able to be part of our COVID response. So Taylor, welcome. Everyone, um, as Emily stated, I'm Taylor McCarty. I go to Wayne State University. I was one of the first, well, my intern group was the first virtual internship group. So I'm be graduating in this May from Wayne State, and then I would like to get my MBA after that. Um, last semester, I mean, last summer, I worked for Joyce and Safety Systems, and then this summer, I worked for Ford, as I said. So my role this summer was to work on the ventilators group. Uh, I would receive invoices, break down the data, and then put them in some of these tables on the right. These are some of the examples I had to do. Um, I had to work cross-functionally throughout the company. I had to work with some of the suppliers, accounts payable team, and our accounts receivable, receivable team. And it really, this really just showed me how many different people were involved in this great process of making ventilators from the people in the plant to people to the white collared workers that were always diligent and making sure that everything was in line and made sure that we were paying people on time and ensuring that we were getting the ventilators out to the people that really needed them in the hospital. And then why I chose Ford. I chose Ford because of the multiple opportunities to learn and grow. Um, every single day I was able to log into my computer. There's always something new to learn and and something that I learned of, like through growth. Um, they have a great culture at Ford, as Emily was talking about before on our truce. Um, Bill O'Dell worked in the purchasing department with us that helped our educational um, development. And he would go through each week, talk about one of the truths, um, about how it applied to our daily work and how we can use it in the future in our programs. And then living in Detroit, I, as I said, I go to Wayne State that's located in Detroit, Michigan. Detroit is on the rise. Every single time you go outside, there's a building that has a new business in it and people are walking. Well, pre-COVID, people are walking. There were so many different people walking the streets and the downtown was always booming, which was really fun. And then we also have four sports teams. So there's nothing that doesn't go, like there's not a weekend or a day there's nothing to do. And also another great thing about Ford that I liked was that we got to meet with a, a lot of upper management people. We would do these Ask Me Anything events where we were able to talk to Bill Ford. Jim Hackett at the time was the CEO. We were able to ask our questions and really get involved and meet these type of people. And then as our talent acquisition team put on many different intern events, and these intern events were really awesome because you were able to meet your fellow interns, even even though it was hard because it was virtually. They like it's cool to still meet people and all that. So thank you, and I'll give it to Emily. Thanks, Taylor, and thanks so much for sharing about your intern experience this summer. We know um, it wasn't ideal, but we pivoted quickly, and we're glad that you had a great summer. So once we created all this PPE, we wanted to make sure it got in the hands of the right people in the right communities. And so for that, we turned to our partners at Ford Fund um, to ensure that we were reaching those most impacted. And so I'd like to invite um, two of our Ford Fund um, representatives to talk a little bit about that. And we'll start with Ben Adiz, who's the manager of global programming and Atlanta partnerships. Um, as Emily mentioned, my name is Ben Adise, and I'm the manager of global programming at the Ford Motor Company Fund. Um, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Sean Thompson, who is our community development manager based in Dearborn, Michigan. Um, as you just heard from Rachel and Deborah, Ford has always stepped up to help in, in times of need. I mean, since the beginning of the company. Um, and while the company was making ventilators and masks, as the philanthropic arm of the company, the Ford Fund's approach to the pandemic was to take immediate action at the local level. And we concentrated on the most critical issues facing the communities throughout the country and around the world. Um, our efforts continue to adjust in order to meet the community needs as they evolve during this global pandemic. And so today, Sean and I are gonna be speaking about our efforts in Southeast Michigan 
as well as globally and how we leveraged our employee network to help communities meet urgent needs. So now I'll pass it over to Sean to share a little bit about what we did in Southeast Michigan. Sean. Thank you, Benna. So what you're looking at here, Ford Motor Company is a sponsor through our relationship with the uh, parade company here locally in Detroit. We sponsor not only the Thanksgiving Day Parade, but we also sponsor the Detroit um, Ford Fireworks. But this year, you know, Michigan found itself in hot spots starting in March and April, and we're trying to think, what could we do and instead of the fireworks that they did not go on display? You know, I think uh, thousands come down to the downtown area to watch the fireworks live on the riverfront. And in the past, we honored veterans. But this year, we just felt that we could not do that based upon CDC and state uh, recommendations with social distancing. But we wanted to come up with something to honor the frontline workers, the healthcare workers, the first responders, police, fire, EMTs, because the fireworks were going on. And they went on on a beautiful night here in Michigan and in August, actually the, the last day of August. But what we decided to do was to honor 100 heroes, honor 100 frontline workers, the police, fire, and EMT. And we delivered, what you're looking at there, is that we delivered a hot meal, a hot picnic basket full of goodies with products made here locally in Michigan were delivered to 100 homes so that they could watch the fireworks at night you know, in the evening with their families and be safe in their own little private bubble. And we also delivered hot meals to a local hospital, one fire department, and one local police department. All in all, 8,000 meals have been delivered to healthcare workers across the region. Now, here in Michigan, and we have three others um, globally, we call them the FRECs, the Ford Resource and Engagement Centers. And normally at the engagement centers, we have two here in Detroit, one in um, 2013 and the next one in 2017. On a typical day, a client could come to our Ford Resource Engagement Centers, we call them the FRECs, to receive um, assistance with their taxes, tax preparation, if they needed assistance with legal support, whether they were getting um, evicted or they needed um, legal help with, um, with their apartment managers or landlords, if they were getting a divorce, we offer through various nonprofit partners these services for them at no cost. If they wanted to learn how to speak English or speak Spanish um, to get their GED, dance courses, um, classes for senior citizens, yoga, at our two local centers here and three others globally, we were able to provide these services for the public. So with the pandemic, we had to shut the resource centers down, but we did not let the community down. We opened up the centers three days a week at one location and four days a week um, at another one. We offered meal distribution. So clients, community residents, they could come and stay in their vehicles. And through our partnership with Gleaners here as a local food pantry here, we placed food within their trunks. They never had to leave their cars. We were able to give them food. As you can see there in the picture of one of my colleagues in the blue there, it's at the east side, Breck. And I will tell you that this was such a need in the community. There's actually two stories that, that come to mind of two kids who rode their bikes to our east side freck and they were so hungry that they received the food and ate the food there on our smart bench right there in front of the freck center and on the uh, one on the southwest side of detroit it's a heavily populated um hispanic community we actually had a senior citizen she didn't have a a, a walker so she used a grocery cart and she Push that grocery cart to our freck to receive some fresh produce. So I'm very proud to be an employee of, of Ford Motor Company, especially part of the Ford Prime team, that we were able to give back to the community that way. And I will tell you, we also heard from the community that they were lacking in fresh produce. 
So we introduced on Thursday evenings for two hour window, fresh produce markets on Thursdays. And we set a record, it was only open for two hours. We had 279 vehicles lined up to receive fresh produce such as eggs, milk, um, gave them fresh uh, fruit as well. So just imagine just 279 vehicles from a two hour period showing up to our, our FRECs to receive things that some of us just take for granted that we could just go and buy. There are no local grocery stores within either of these um, two centers. So we were very happy about that. And I can tell you that since March and until today, Ford has distributed at these two um, FREC centers over a million pounds of food. And we are also distributing PPE, masks, um, once a month, which is actually going on today, um, local time from 1 to 4 p.m., our FRECs are open where the public can come in and receive um, packs of 20 masks. They never have to leave their vehicle. We're passing it on to them through their trunks or handing it to them with our own PPN. So we're very, very proud of that. But one thing we did not want to do was to let the community down and having some sort of fun. Kids haven't been able to come to our centers. So for Halloween, we're going to have a trunk or treat. Our clients, we call them clients, but they're community residents. They can come to the FREC on October 30th and receive a special treat bag for a two hour window. We're going to pack those bags with earbuds. We heard from the community due to virtual school that homes that have multiple kids, they can't hear. They can't hear because they're speaking over each other, multiple laptops, Chromebooks going. So we're going to donate earbuds to the kids in those areas on a first come first serve basis. We're going to have some fun too. We're going to load them up on candy and we're going to give them some popcorn that's going to be donated by a local cinema um, um, partner here. And we're going to give them some old school games like Uno. We're going to give them books and then we're going to ask them to go home and then join us later that evening for a fresh virtual Halloween party. Because in the past last year, I think we gave away 4,000 pounds of candy. We can't do that this year because of um, COVID, but we wanted them to have fun. So come get a treat back. And then later in that evening, we're having a Freck virtual Halloween spooky party. We're calling it Fractacular. We're going to have a, a spooky storytelling um, contest going on. We're going to have DJs. And we're also going to have a slime contest. And we're going to give each family that comes, each vehicle will receive a pumpkin. So we can do a pumpkin carving contest. So this is just our way that Ford is giving back to the community in a safe and social distance um, environment. And there's also some amazing work that's going on in our Bangkok FREC. And for that, I'm going to let my colleague Benna tell you about it. Thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, as, as Sean mentioned, we um, have three international FRECs. Um, one is located in Craiova, Romania, and um, another in Pretoria, South Africa, right outside of Johannesburg, where we have manufacturing facilities. And the third one is in um, Bangkok, Thailand. And at the onset of the pandemic, um, we had volunteer doctors and nurses use our Bangkok FREC space to train community members um, on COVID-19 safety. And they also set up a care package assembly process in the kitchen with sanitized clean zones marked off to prioritize safety. Um, the care packages included enough rice, canned fish, soy milk, fruit, vegetables, et cetera, for 30 meals, as well as soap, hand sanitizer, and masks. And by the end of June, they distributed more than 13,000 care packages. That is a thousand packages a week and enough to serve 400,000 meals to the city's most vulnerable. So it was an enormous effort. And like all of our efforts, it was quickly activated with the help of our community partners and our local employees. One of our most heartwarming and satisfying outcomes for our team in the last few months has been the response from our employees. Um, almost immediately after Ford closed its doors in March, we started hearing from employees wanting to help. Uh, you know, with traditional methods of volunteering not safe or practical, uh, we decided to launch the Ford Fund COVID-19 Donation Match Program, 
which gave employees a way to participate in helping through our partners and the communities that we serve. So the match was launched with a combination of $500,000 from the Ford Fund and Bill Ford. And we worked with our global teams to select organizations that we have strong relationships with that were dealing with the crisis in their direct communities. And by the end of it, this um, match donation ended at the end of July and we had raised $1.3 million, which we were overwhelmingly proud of. Um, and the funds were helped, you know, communities in 20 different countries, 14 U.S. states, and 47 community organizations. So it was, it was truly a tremendous effort, and it, you know, kind of coincided with what the company was doing at the time. Um, if you want to learn more about what the Ford Fund is doing during the pandemic and, and any other areas we work, we um, recommend you go to our website, uh, FordFund.org. Um, but anyway, thanks everyone for listening and I'll toss it back to Emily. John and Benna, thank you so much. Um, it's so inspiring and we're so proud of the work Ford Fund does. So thank you. Um, we want to transition into questions now. Um, and Deborah, I want to start with you. One of the questions that came in was, why do you think we're able to make such a quick pivot to go from manufacturing um, vehicles to PPE in a matter of weeks? But it's a it's a couple of things. One is that Bill Ford was he's he's really our mentor and kind of our north star. So we knew from the very top that no one at Ford had to question whether this was something that we needed to do. And once you eliminate that kind of uncertainty, then miraculous things happen. So I mean, we've got plenty of smart people, right? All you need is to do it without fear. And because we knew that everybody was on board with this that this is who we stand for. In fact, many of us joined Ford because we knew about this DNA, this is what our corporate culture is. Then these amazing things started happening. And I, I think, and I'm looking to all of my other panelists here, I think that we surprised ourselves a little bit. I, I mean, we were up at two o'clock in the morning in meetings and the next morning, and you'd be up three hours later and something else amazing had happened because someone was able to really take it to the next level. And so I think, uh, we were, I think that we were surprised ourselves how fast we were able to move. Thanks so much. Um, another question that's come in, and Rachel, I'm going to throw this one to you. So, you know, unfortunately, it seems COVID is not going away. I know here in Michigan, we just hit another record daily cases yesterday. Um, so the, we're living with this for a while. Where do you think Ford goes in terms of our production um, of masks? Are we going to keep doing this? What What does the future look like as long as COVID's around? The future will look like really how it started. Project Apollo and our efforts exist because we listened to the community, listened to local officials, we listened to the federal government about what was needed. You know, we didn't come up with these. We, we wanted to help because we knew there was a need, but we're not dictating, right, what needs to happen because, you know, we don't know. We want to rely on the folks that are on the ground managing this and just be able to provide our skills, talents, and our manufacturing ability to meet that. So where it goes will be dependent upon where it started. What do the communities need? And that's why we moved to 2.0 with face mass development. We kept hearing from organizations, from city officials saying, you know, there are communities in my district, jurisdiction, people that I represent in my backyard who still don't have access to PPE. Do you think you can help? Do you think you can produce more masks? And we said, yes. And so we bought new mask machines to increase that production. So where it goes will be dependent on the ongoing need. We've said through 2021, because that's what we've been hearing from folks, but if that changes, then we'll change too. Again, you know, we're not we're not in this to drive the response. We are in it to just provide our talent and our focus and our desire to help. And we're going to continue to be responsive to that until there isn't a need. Thanks for that. Hopefully, hopefully the need dries up very quickly, but it's it's comforting to know um, that we will be there while the need is still there. So Taylor, I'm going to toss one to you. So thinking about your internship, um, can you tell us maybe what was the biggest lesson you learned um, during your internship? I would say the biggest lesson I learned 
during my internship was always be like on your feet. You never know, especially during this um, COVID times, you never know what's going to end up. Because when I got hired, it was supposed to be all in person. And then it was this the fear of, oh, I'm not going to have an internship. And then the fear of, oh, what am I going to do virtually? How am I going to meet people and all that? So just being on your feet, being able to adapt to new environment, new cir- new circumstances is very key. And that's probably my biggest, one of the biggest things I learned is how to adapt and how to adjust to the virtual atmosphere. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Adapt's really the word of 2020. And I know we were um, internally talking in March and April about how do we still provide a great internship experience, knowing that it was not safe in person. Um, so, so happy that we were able to do um, the internships virtually. And then Sean and Benna, from a Ford Fund perspective, so we may have people out there, and I know you gave the website, but watching and saying, I want to get involved. Um, this is great work, and either I want to get involved and donate my time or, or my money, or I need assistance. What's the best way for someone to get connected with Ford Fund um, and start that conversation? Well, uh, here locally, and I'll let um, Ben speak uh, globally, but locally, because of the pandemic, our FRECs are closed. So they're only closed to essential appointment only um, scenarios, such as example, if a woman needed assistance because there's abuse at home, you know, there's a lot of that going on right now due to COVID, we have attorneys there that she can come and speak to for free. And then we had a, a tax accountants there. The taxes were delayed this summer. So they were there and swamped. So we only, and jobs, if you were looking, seeking jobs, we opened it up for that, but appointments only. So right now they're closed and I don't see them opening up again um, for the remainder of the year. And I honestly can't say when they're going to open back up due to COVID. But I would direct everyone to please just visit FordFund.org because once we open, it will be listed there. And if someone wanted to volunteer their time, we would just simply connect them with one of our nonprofit partners and then um, they could help that way. Um, There's no money donations. Ford Fund supplies uh, grants to nonprofit organizations. You have to be a 501c3 to participate at our FREX. So, but your time is valuable. So I'm sure that there are um, some of our partners once we reopen that would would welcome that. I mean, even if it's um, giving passing out food in our pantry, because once we reopen, the clients can come inside and shop dignity and pick their own groceries, pick their own diapers, pick their own, like if they need to pay socks, they select it themselves and then they walk out without paying. Well, we need someone to help put the products on the shelf. So there are volunteer situations, but unfortunately, until we get ourselves in a better situation in the world, we have to put that on hold. Anna, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, just to, just to add to what Sean said, you know, obviously the, the pandemic has um, made us kind of shift our, our volunteer opportunities um, significantly. You know, usually we have a plethora of volunteer activities on our website that people can register for and, and go and help our organizations and our partners in their communities, not just in Southeast Michigan, but um, in the United States, as well as in, in other countries around the world. Um, but right now, that is kind of on hold. Um, we do we are starting to ramp up our skills-based volunteer opportunities. Um, we've partnered with a service called Catch a Fire that um, I don't, I, I think it should have just launched or is launching soon, but that will um, basically connect people that want to volunteer with organizations that need um, services or expertise in, in various fields, such as accounting or marketing or whatever the organization might need. So it's basically pro bono work, um, you know, in, in our volunteer system. So um, again, if you just go to our website, fordfund.org, um, you can find all of this information there. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and one last question that came in, and Rachel, I'm going to toss it to you. And Deborah, if you have anything to add, please um, join in. How do you think our 
involvement in helping to prevent and fight coronavirus is going to help us in the future? That's a great question. I think if anything, I guess I'll start from an internal standpoint. I think as a, as a company, it kind of gets back to what Deborah was talking about, that we know what we're capable of in a crisis. We've always known that. But applying that to situations that aren't crises, how can we optimize what we're doing? How can we continue to benefit the community in times when it isn't this massive global need, right? We know what we're capable of and we know how creative we can be. I think there's so many lessons learned that we're still kind of as a team unpacking, you know, how do we apply this, this drive, this emotion, this energy to every facet of what we do? Uh, so we're learning a lot about that. And I think externally, you know, now it's just to be prepared for our workforce and, and know that we have to shift in these uncertain times. And, and that's just something that we'll all take with us moving forward once we do come out of this. So it's all made us stronger, I think, uh, going through this together. It's certainly bonded relationships, I think, with colleagues and other teams that maybe normally didn't work with each other. So all of those, I think, are kind of silver linings for us as we move forward through this. And, and like you were saying, Emily, in the beginning, making tomorrow up as we go, literally creating it, uh, one of our key tenants. So I hope that spirit continues, and I think it will. Yeah, thanks so much. And it's, you know, one of our tenants is being built Ford Proud. And it's amazing just sitting here as a Ford employee and hearing. Um, I knew we were doing all of this, didn't know all of the details, but it just, it makes me Ford Proud. So thank you to everyone and thank you for your work and your leadership on this. Um, and thanks to those that joined us today. And if you're sitting out there also feeling built Ford Proud and wondering how you can join the team, um, we would love to direct you to careers.ford.com. We do have a number of positions currently available, um, especially in our campus um, internship and Ford College graduate positions. So please take a look at those, um, see what makes sense um, to apply to, and we'd love to continue that conversation. Follow us on our social media, especially um, Ford Motor Company on LinkedIn and Ford Motor Company Careers on Facebook to stay up to date on what um, we are doing and how you can connect with us. So thank you so much, and thanks again to our panelists, and 